ladies and gentlemen, happy Bill of Rights Day! I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, the National Constitution Center. And I see a lot of uh, friends here, and we now have an important responsibility on Bill of Rights Day, and that is to recite the inspiring charter of the National Constitution Center to inspire people throughout Philadelphia and through C-SPAN around the world. So before doing that, I think I better put aside uh, the, the great book we're going to be discussing. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to recite not only the first part, but the entire congressional charter. And I know you can do it. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And here's the second part. And this is the purpose of our charter in order to increase understanding of the Constitution among the American people. And that is what we are going to do today as we celebrate Bill of Rights Day. On December 15th, 1791, the Bill of Rights was ratified. And the first 10 amendments, which are now known as the Bill of Rights, have become iconic of American liberty throughout the globe. But as we'll learn today in a fascinating series of discussions, the Bill of Rights was not always known as the Bill of Rights. It wasn't until December 15th, 1941, in the heart of World War II, that President Roosevelt first began referring to the Bill of Rights as the Bill of Rights. And in our first panel, we're going to learn from Gerard Malioka how this uh, first 10 amendments came to be known as the Bill of Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you something else that is very important. We have downstairs, just uh, across the way, one of the 12 surviving original copies of the Bill of Rights. George Washington sent out 13 copies to the states and one to the federal government. 12 survive. This copy has been at the Constitution Center for the past three years, and it's just here for another few months. It's then going to go back to the New York Public Library, which is sharing it with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for 100 years, and it'll come back to us in three years. But you have today a unique and rare opportunity to see one of the 12 surviving copies of the Bill of Rights, and I want you uh, to do that. I'm going to finally say that uh, this is the end of our winter uh, 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 season, but we're about to reconvene in January with a series of blockbuster programs, including visits from uh, Mayor Nutter, the historian Joseph Ellis, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who will be here in February, and you have to all join. And we'll also have the launch of uh, the riveting and uh, much anticipated uh, new biography by yours truly of that constitutional hero, William Howard Taft. So I hope you'll come. <laughs> I hope you'll come join for that. And in fact, Judge Douglas Ginsburg, who'll be interviewing me about the Taft book, told me William Howard Taft is the most underappreciated figure since George Mason, who refused to ratify the Constitution because it contained no Bill of Rights. So we'll hear now about who George Mason was and what his role was in creating the Bill of Rights. It's now my tremendous pleasure to introduce our, fir our first uh, guest. Um, and uh, Gerard Malioka is Samuel R. Rosen Professor at the Indiana University uh, Robert H. McKinney School of Law. He's the author of a series of great books, including the definitive biography of John Bingham, who was the James Madison of Reconstruction, the man who wrote the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed equal protection of the law. And today, he's here to discuss his new book, so new that I just have the printout uh, version, but it'll be out very soon, The Heart of the Constitution, How the Bill of Rights Became the Bill of Rights. Please join me in welcoming Gerard Malioka. Welcome. So excited you're here. Let us jump right into the heart of this book. It's December 15th, 1941, in the heart of World War II. And Franklin Roosevelt is culminating a national radio address celebrating Bill of Rights Day. And this is preceded by parades in Chicago and New York, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia presides over a parade 
with 10 placards bearing the first 10 amendments. Uh, there's a radio broadcast by Hollywood celebrities called We Hold These Truths, heard by 63 million Americans, uh, where they hear Orson Welles, Jimmy Stewart, and Lionel Barrymore all celebrating the Bill of Rights. I love this detail about Edward G. Robinson playing a man sitting in jail for criticizing his town mayor. He says, none of this Gestapo stuff, not that they wouldn't try it if they could, but that little 450 word matter you're celebrating tonight stops them short of it. And then you have President Roosevelt giving his historic address. Free Americans, he says, I can't resist this. No date in the long history of freedom means more to liberty-loving men in all liberty-loving countries than the 15th day of December, 1791. On that day, <laughs> please, one more sentence. 150 years ago, a new nation, through the elected Congress, adopted a declaration of human rights which has influenced the thinking of all mankind. So this is the, thank, thank you, no, it's nothing. <laughs> We, um, uh, this is, I'll, I'll resist the uh, Orson Welles imitation. <laughs> um, it, amazing, 63 million people listening to the president um, and having parades around the country celebrating the Bill of Rights, and yet you say this is one of the first times that a president is talking about the Bill of Rights as a Bill of Rights. James Buchanan was the first president to refer to the Bill of Rights, but Washington didn't, Lincoln didn't. Why is it that in 1941, a week after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt is referring to the Bill of Rights and Americans around the country are celebrating. Well, uh, first, thanks for, thanks for coming and thanks for having me here. Uh, the interesting thing about this commemoration in 1941 is it is the first national celebration of the Bill of Rights. Now, that's an odd thing because it had been 150 years since the ratification of the first 10 amendments. So part of what motivated me to think about the book is to say, well, what, why did it take until 1941 to have a national celebration like this? Now, part of the answer is because the Bill of Rights became much more important in American culture in the 1930s and the 1940s, and really up until that point, it wasn't particularly important in American law or culture. Now, the fact that this celebration came about in 1941 on December 15th was, in some sense, a coincidence. It was the 150th anniversary. Nobody knew that Pearl Harbor was going to happen a week before this event, right? Um, so, it, though this coincidence that Pearl Harbor happened right before the 150th anniversary meant that this day became sort of supercharged with patriotic sentiment, right? And that was also combined with the fact that Roosevelt's speech on Bill of Rights Day was essentially an explanation of why we were fighting Hitler. Because, you know, if you think about it, Pearl Harbor happens on December 7th. On December 8th, the president asks for a declaration of war against Japan. A couple of days after that, Hitler gives a speech in which he says he's going to declare war on the United States. This speech on Bill of Rights Day that uh, was just eloquently uh, read to you uh, was the first presidential statement about why are we fighting Hitler? Right? And Roosevelt's answer was, we're fighting Hitler to save the Bill of Rights for ourselves and for the world. Right? Now that turned the Bill of Rights, of course, into this very important emblem of American patriotism, a place that it's really held ever since. Uh, wonderful. So the historical context is central. Um, uh, and yet, as you show, for most of American history, uh, the Bill of Rights is not referred to as the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence is even more likely to be called the Bill of Rights than the first 10 amendments. Let us go back to the beginning and the time of the framing of the convention and understand why it was that the original Constitution contained no Bill of Rights, and why James Madison changed his mind and eventually came to support the creation of a Bill of Rights. To do that, you help us understand what the revolutionary era state constitutions conceived of as Bills of Rights. And uh, our great audience knows that the interactive constitution, uh, which is the National Constitution Center's online constitution, includes those revolutionary era state constitutions, and I want you to download them. 
not now because we're talking, but after the show, go to the Interactive Constitution and click on the Bill of Rights and you can see the Virginia Declaration of 1776 written by George Mason, the, P the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 and so forth. And you can see the amendments that Madison made that were not actually adopted. I want to read one of them because it sums up uh, Jared's point that the framers understood bills of rights um, as prefaces, not as appendixes, that were broad statements of philosophical principles rather than uh, binding legal restraints on government. Madison says, uh, channeling Mason, that all power is originally vested in and consequently derived from the people, that government is instituted and ought to be exercised for the benefit of the people, which consists in the enjoyment of life and liberty, the right of acquiring and using property and generally pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety, that the people have an indubitable, inalienable, and indefeasible right to reform or change their government whenever it be found adverse or inadequate to the purposes of ins its institutions. That sounds just like the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence. It's, it was taken from George Mason's Declaration of 1776. Tell us about how that preface, which Madison wanted to put at the top of the Constitution, not at the end, sums up what the framers understood as a Bill of Rights. Right, so when people thought about Bills of Rights at the time of the founding, they were looking at the state Bills of Rights. Not all states had a Bill of Rights, but some did, and the ones that did basically followed the model set out in Virginia by George Mason, the underrated person that uh, Jeff was talking about earlier. And what did these bills of rights look like? Well, first, they all came at the beginning of the state constitution. And second, they all began with a series of statements that sound a lot like the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, these sort of grand rhetorical statements about natural law and popular sovereignty and so on, which were supposed to be the preface for the specific legal rights that came later. Um, now, Madison then tried to propose something similar in the First Congress because there were a lot of complaints from the anti-federalists and those who were critical of the Constitution that the Constitution did not have such a preface uh, at its beginning. So Madison tried to introduce a preface and a series of changes that he wanted to insert directly into different points of the Constitution where he thought they were appropriate. Uh, Congress, though, rejected this. The House of Representatives, for a variety of reasons, decided they didn't want to have a preface or they didn't want to change the preface that was already in the Constitution about we the people. So as a result, what ended up being ratified was put at the end of the Constitution, not the beginning, and didn't have any sort of grand introduction the way the state bills of rights did. So consequently, almost nobody thought that what was ratified in 1791 was a bill of rights. Uh, the only person who one time called it a bill of rights was Jefferson, but that was in a letter and it, he never mentioned it again. And Madison, who of course now everybody says, oh, he wrote the Bill of Rights. He never said what he had written was a Bill of Rights. From the time it was ratified until the time he died, which was 45 years later, and he wrote about a lot of things and certainly wasn't shy about taking credit for things, but he never said, I wrote the Bill of Rights or what was ratified was the Bill of Rights. Why? Because he didn't think it was a Bill of Rights and neither did most Americans. The Revolutionary Era documents were called declarations of rights, uh, the Virginia and Pennsylvania and so forth, and they were playing off the British uh, model. Tell us about the British Bill of Rights, what it was, and why it was phrased in, or, or in terms of what c Parliament ought to do rather than what it was prohibited from doing. Right, so the term Bill of Rights comes primarily from the English Bill of Rights, which followed the uh, glorious Revolution of 1688. And the English Bill of Rights was a statute, a parliamentary statute, that sort of put into place many fundamental rights that are still enforced there and then became sort of important here. Uh, now, of course, in, under the British Constitution, the sort of unwritten or uncodified Constitution that they have, Parliament can theoretically do anything that it wants. So, uh, to the extent that there was a statute saying that things can or cannot be done, when they're framed f towards what a future parliament can do, it says more or less you shouldn't do this, right, while recognizing that, that you, you can do something because 
your parliament and parliament is supreme. The state, the early state bills of rights copied that sort of model by saying, uh, using words like, you ought not to do things, right? Now, if you think about it, right, that's not the same as saying you shall not, right? Ought not is try not to, but you know, you can if you want. Shall not is you can't. Now, what makes the first set of amendments distinctive is that they use the mandatory word shall repeatedly to describe what is being prohibited. And that was because by the time the first set of amendments were introduced, both Jefferson and Madison had to some extent come around to the view that, well, one thing that you could get from a Bill of Rights or a set of amendments would be that it would provide the judiciary with the opportunity to strike down certain laws that violated these provisions. And that, you know, having the mandatory language in there was both necessary and appropriate. And that is a change that eventually worked its way into future state bills of rights when new states sort of entered the union in the 19th century. So judicial enforcement of the Bill of Rights helped uh, Madison support its adoption. Uh, there were two other reasons, you know, why Madison changed his mind about whether a Bill of Rights was necessary. Initially, he'd said that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary or dangerous. Unnecessary because the Constitution itself was a Bill of Rights, and since Congress was given no power to abridge free speech, it wouldn't be in danger of doing so. And uh, dangerous because if you wrote down certain rights, people might assume if the right wasn't written down, it wasn't protected. Tell us why Madison changed his mind, the role of the great anti-federalists like George Mason and Elbridge Gerry and in persuading him to change his mind, and why he eventually decided to propose the Bill of Rights. Right, so as, as you'll hear in the next panel, M Madison, part of Madison's role was as a politician. And what he saw in the debates on the Constitution was that there was considerable uh, disquiet about the fact that the Constitution lacked a Bill of Rights. So being a practical person much of the time, Madison changed his mind partly because he felt like the introduction of a Bill of Rights would help to prevent the calling of another constitutional convention. That was what he was afraid of. He and the other Federalists were concerned that if you had another constitutional convention called for, that that would just be a disaster because it was so difficult to put together the compromises that you got out of the first constitutional convention. Now, the other thing to point out is that there were two states, North Carolina and Rhode Island, that had refused to ratify the Constitution, and when the first Congress convened, they weren't there. So there was also the thought that, well, if you add something, like a Bill of Rights, that might satisfy their concerns and bring them into the Union, because, of course, to have a union made up of less than 13 states would have been a problem in terms of, well, creating the possibility of foreign influence uh, within the colonies or within the new nation. So, I mean, much of his uh, change of heart was really just to meet these particular political problems that they were facing in 1789. The other thing that must be said is Jefferson was very keen on bills of rights, writing to Madison from France, right? and wrote him a series of letters in which he basically made various arguments for why there should be a Bill of Rights. And Madison, uh, you know, kind of gave this, this kind of rather odd answer in which he, he said, oh, you know, I've, al I've always been for a Bill of Rights, you know, uh, and once he decided he was for it, and, uh, and then proceeded to, to follow up on some of Jefferson's rationales, including judicial review, for why we should have something like a Bill of Rights in the federal constitution, just in a form that didn't turn out to be the form that they ended up with once it had gone through the legislative process. Great, so Madison changes his mind, and he originally proposes not 10 amendments, but 19. And you can check out the original 19 amendments on the interactive constitution. And I do want you to go to the app store and download the interactive constitution and see the amendments. The one Madison thought was the most important in the whole bunch said that no state shall infringe the equal rights of conscience or press or trial by jury. Why did Madison think that that was the most important amendment? Uh, and it didn't pass, of course, and it took the 14th Amendment, uh, passed after the Civil War, to restrict the states as well as the federal government from violating the Bill of Rights. Well, in this period, Madison was more of a nationalist. And 
took the view that state governments presented a serious problem for individual rights. I mean, he was in particular focused on states that had, through their legislatures, engaged in kind of confiscations of property or other uh, things that he considered to be abuses. And he argued quite strenuously in the Constitutional Convention for greater restrictions on the states in the new Constitution. Now, uh, there's a wonderful book that came out last year talking about how Madison edited his notes about the Constitutional Convention for years after the fact and tried to tone down some of the things that he said because later they were sort of inconsistent with the positions that he took once he was an elected member of Congress from Virginia. So at the very beginning of the first Congress, he still retained something of this nationalist view. And so he did propose that a more limitations be brought into the Constitution on the states. Now, whether he did that in the thought that it would actually pass or just because it was something that he felt just its introduction would be satisfactory to enough people, I, I'm not sure. But, um, but that was really his concern, which was not shared by most people in Congress and kind of quickly went, went nowhere. So Madison's uh, original uh, apply the Bill of Rights against the states amendment went nowhere, and Congress instead proposed 12 amendments. The original First Amendment was not the free speech amendment, but one that said that after uh, a certain period of time, there should be one representative added in Congress for every 50,000 inhabitants. If that had passed, there would be 6,000 Congress people today, <laughs> making the US Congress the biggest representative body in the world. The Chinese House of Delegates is 3,000 people, so it's just as well that that didn't pass, but that reflected the anti-federalist concern that uh, representatives not get too removed from the people and there be enough of them. The original Second Amendment prohibited Congress from raising its salary without an intervening election. That became the 27th Amendment in 1992. Why did those first uh, amendments, the first two amendments, not pass? Well, uh, it's a little hard to know because we don't have good records on the debates that occurred on these amendments in the states when they were sent out for ratification. But one thing that uh, people have pointed out is uh, that, first of all, the very smallest states didn't like the idea of a very large House of Representatives, right? They wanted the House to be as small as possible because that would maximize their influence in the House. So, for example, Delaware didn't ratify this amendment about this new, very large uh, House of Representatives that you get as the population grew. So uh, that amendment fell short in part because the small states objected. Um, the pay amendment just seems not to have been something that people were particularly interested in until basically about the 1970s. I mean, just there, there wasn't any interest. Of course, you know, that amendment ultimately was ratified as a 27th Amendment. You know, we don't, nobody, though, thinks that that's part of the Bill of Rights, even though it was one of the ones that Madison proposed, right? So just the fact that Madison proposed it is not enough, apparently, to get you into the Bill of Rights uh, sort of circle. Um, but uh, it's a little less clear as to why that, that amendment went nowhere. I'll add that one thing I was not able to learn, though I hoped I could find the answer uh, in researching this book, is why were they numbered in the way that they were? You know, why was it that the, sort of they went in the order that they did? And I, it, apparently there's really no reason. There's no particular reason as to why they, they go in that order. Now, of course, the order matters by happenstance, because since the first two amendments that Jeff talked about were not ratified, then the one about speech and religion became the First Amendment. And you know, to some extent, people sometimes think, oh, it, it's first, so it must have been like the most important. But of course, that wasn't the idea, right? It was, just became first because the first two didn't get ratified, and it's not clear why it was numbered number three out of the list of 12 in the first place. So, it, but, but the, the fact of it being the First Amendment, I think, matters sometimes for, for people when they think about it. If Madison had initially wanted to insert the amendments into the body of the Constitution, was there any relevance in the placement of the places in the original Constitution the amendments were supposed to go? Yes, so for the most part, he wanted to basically create a kind of, what I call in the book, Constitution 2.0, right? So he would just put the edits directly into the Constitution, and you'd have a brand new Constitution with the edits. And all of the provisions that are in the Bill of Rights would have gone into the section, Article 1, uh, section 9 that limited the federal government and limited what Congress could do, okay? So that would have made it, made explicit what eventually the Supreme Court found to be implicit, which was that 
those amendments were designed originally to limit only the federal government, the one about limits on the states having been removed. Um, now, there's an irony in this, because had Madison gotten his way, the amendments would have been scattered around to some extent within the Constitution, and it would be harder, I think, for us to think of them as a distinctive group, because they'd just be kind of part of the Constitution. The fact that he failed to get that form of edit through, and instead they put them all together as a group at the end, makes it easier for us or for subsequent generations of Americans to look at that group and think, oh, that's a special group because it was all added together at once at the end, and it's the Bill of Rights. So uh, it's sort of it, what made it look, makes it look like a Bill of Rights to us is not really what was sort of the plan that Madison had when he put in the proposal to begin with. You mentioned Article I, Section 9, restricting the powers of Congress. Uh, in 1833, in a case called Barron and Baltimore, as you suggested, Chief Justice John Marshall held that the Bill of Rights did not bind the states, it only bound Congress. And Marshall said, if Congress had wanted to bind the states, it would have said so, but instead the amendments say Congress shall make no law, they don't say the states shall make no law. And in that opinion, Marshall described Article I, Section 9 itself as in the nature of a Bill of Rights. And you say in that period, to the degree that anyone talked about a National Bill of Rights, most people gave that honor to the Declaration of Independence. So tell us about Marshall's conception of the, uh, the first 10 amendments not binding the states and, 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 and why he viewed Article I, Section 9 as a Bill of Rights. Well, right, so John Marshall never referred to the first set of amendments as a Bill of Rights. Uh, and in the opinion that he wrote saying that they did not apply to the actions of state governments, he didn't call them a Bill of Rights. He called Article I, Section 9 of the Constitution in the nature of a Bill of Rights. Why? Well, because it was a list of restrictions on the federal government and a list of what were considered to be very important restrictions at the time, which now we don't think of so much when we, when we discuss constitutional law. Um, now, I mean, the, the, pa the fact that uh, the amendments were not held to be limiting the actions of state governments, that was not a particularly controversial point of view at the time, uh, though there were people who rejected that interpretation. Now, interestingly, the people who did reject that interpretation then and then in subsequent years did so in part by calling the first 10 amendments the Bill of Rights. Now, why did they do that? Because that was a way of trying to explain why they should be an exception to states' rights, right? Because if you believe in states' rights, you could say, well, yes, but not for the Bill of Rights, right? That, that can't be something that states' rights can trump. But of course, the, 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 they were calling it the Bill of Rights because they wanted to do something, namely extend the protections in them to the states, not because they were sort of intrinsically or always known as the Bill of Rights. So that was in part a response to what the Supreme Court had done in Barron. One of the heroes who referred to the First Ten Amendments as a Bill of Rights was John Bingham. And here, it'll be hard to see it, but here's a photograph of him. You've written the definitive biography of Bingham. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to read Jared's phenomenal biography of Bingham. But why did Bingham refer to the First Ten Amendments to the Bill of Rights? Why did he t tell us about how he told Congress in proposing the 14th Amendment, I read Barron in Baltimore, and just as John Marshall said, if Congress had intended to apply the Bill of Rights to the states, they would have said so. Reading Marshall's language, I decided to do exactly what Marshall said and say no state shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizenship, making clear his, Bingham's, intention to unequivocally apply the First Ten Amendments uh, uh, against the states. Tell us about Bingham's vision and why he viewed the first 10 amendments or the first eight amendments as a Bill of Rights. Right, well, one thing to note is that he viewed the first eight amendments as the Bill of Rights, not the first 10, okay? And that's a, something, we can get into that a little bit more later, but um, look, part of it was it's a tool of persuasion, right? Why do you use one term for something rather than another term? Because you think it'll be more convincing. Indeed, if you wanted to say, we have important rights that we want to protect now, we might say, I want to have an animal bill of rights. I want to have an environmental bill of rights. Why? Why attach bill of rights? Because it just is more persuasive given the history of that term in our country. Now, in Bingham's case, he didn't refer to the first set of amendments as a bill of rights until 1866 when they were considering the 14th Amendment and when he decided that 
he needed to refer to them that way in order to get them extended to the actions of state governments, which he believed was important because of the abuses that had occurred in the South prior to the Civil War, not just against slaves, but against anyone who spoke out against slavery or acted in a way that was contrary to slavery, such as trying to teach religious precepts to slaves or you know, people who were put on trial in, for various violations of state laws, largely because they were criticizing slavery and they were deprived of basic protections that were found in the first set of amendments. So uh, Bingham chose that term quite deliberately, uh, in my view, uh, to try to convince doubters that the first set of amendments should be extended. Now, by contrast, the people who were against extending the first set of amendments or against the 14th Amendment in general did not call the first set of amendments the Bill of Rights. They refused to use that term. They just said, they're amendments. You know, no different than any other amendment or part of the Constitution, right? And they were denying in that sense that they were special and, they're, and also denying that there was any reason to extend them to the states. And that is something that continued into the 20th century uh, in terms of people being for the extension of the Bill of Rights or the first set of amendments to the states, calling it the Bill of Rights, and people who were against it refusing to use that term. Now, once we got far enough into the 20th century, then everybody started using that term, which also coincided with the fact that these provisions started to get extended more broadly to the states. So um, the epigraph of your book is striking. It is from... Justice Samuel Miller, and it says, our Constitution, and the book is uh, cascading around, and that's John Bingham, so I better pick him up and put him in a place of honor right here. Um, our Constitution, unlike most modern ones, does not contain a formal declaration or Bill of Rights. Justice Samuel Miller, 1880, amazing, despite the fact that John Bingham wrote the 14th Amendment to apply the Bill of Rights against the states, Miller said, we have no Bill of Rights, it's a complicated story about how the Supreme Court in the slaughterhouse cases eviscerated Bingham's vision and refused to apply the Bill of Rights against the states, but broadly tell us what was going on in the 1880s, 90s, and the turn of the century such that a justice like Miller could say that we have no Bill of Rights that binds the states. Well, in politics, it's not clear that it's great to be ahead of your time, <laughs> right? Because that's another way of saying you failed. And you know, this, this new terminology that Bingham and others used to try to convince people that the first set of amendments should extend to the states just didn't catch on. Uh, and so really there wasn't a change in the way people thought about the Bill of Rights until the Spanish-American War. Uh, that's really kind of the first turning point, um, in part because uh, people who were critical of our acquisition of colonies like the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Guam as a result of the Spanish-American War um, said that, oh, well, it was illegitimate to have permanent colonies like this, you know, imperial colonies, because they would not get the benefits of the Bill of Rights. Now, again, that was sort of the Bill of Rights here was being used as a tool, though this time kind of as a tool to criticize a federal policy. Right? And then a response to that was to say, oh, well, okay, we can give the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico a Bill of Rights. Of course, what they were given was something much less than the first set of amendments. It was kind of this um, slim down, very much slimmed down version of the first set of amendments. But that seemed to satisfy enough people such that the acquisition of these colonies was seen as legitimate in much the same way that the addition of the amendments in 1791 seemed to satisfy enough people that the Constitution was sound such that it kind of achieved its purpose. So it's a way in which people both started to refer to the first set of amendments as a Bill of Rights more frequently, but also it shows how that was used in a kind of practical or political way rather than sort of something that people were looking to just because they were very important rights. Speaking of slimmed down versions, this gives us an opportunity to take a beat on the constitutional vision of William Howard Taft, because he was the governor of the Philippines at a time this debate was taking place. 
and there were three positions in the country. The uh, natural law Democrats, as you described, led by William Jennings Bryan, said that the God-given rights of the Declaration of Independence should apply to all people, uh, foreigns and aliens, uh, uh, citizens and aliens alike, and should extend to the Philippines. Uh, the uh, uh, progressive imperialists, like Senator George Beveridge, said that we had the right to impose our will on the Philippines and didn't have to extend them any rights. And Taft, the moderate Republican, said uh, the Philippine people should be entitled to those parts of the Bill of Rights that they're ready to exercise based on their level of education. And that didn't include, for example, the right to bear arms, which could be too dangerous. So one more uh, beat about how this debate about how, about how much of the Bill of Rights to extend abroad helped shape Americans' conception of the significance of the Bill of Rights. Well, yeah, I mean, one, one part of the story of the Bill of Rights is how things going on abroad made the Bill of Rights more important here at home. So one example of that, really the first important example, is what was going on in the Philippines. That is the, the, the question of how, what do you do with the Philippines or how do you govern it, right, in part had this feedback loop into what people thought about the Bill of Rights at home, or at least that was the effect it had over time. Now, it's also fair to say that to some extent the debate about what rights to extend to the Philippines or Puerto Rico or Guam gives us an insight into what people thought was really important at the time, right? And the answer is, well, um, some things that you might expect to have been extended, like freedom of speech, were extended. Other things where you might understand why they, they weren't interested in extending them, like the right to bear arms to people who were under, uh, you know, in a, in a colonized situation, you can understand that. But jury trial rights were also not extended to these colonies. Now, there were different explanations for that. I mean, one you might understand is sort of that there was a thought that, well, people on these juries would be the people who lived there and thus might be not so keen on you know, promoting the authority of the people who were running the, co the colonial governments. But also you could simply say people also had a, a somewhat different perception in some respects as to the importance of jury trial at the time as compared to the way it was perceived earlier and maybe is perceived now. Uh, that is, they thought it was less important, relatively speaking. So, I mean, you can see both in the states when people had to write new bills of rights and then when Congress had to consider bills of rights for overseas colonies, well, whatever they ended up putting together as the Bill of Rights, whether they added things that were not in the first 10 amendments or they took things out from what were in the first 10 amendments, told you something about what people were thinking at the time about what was important or unimportant. So we're up to uh, uh, the election of 1912 is fought in particular in, in partly on a question of how much of the Bill of Rights applies abroad. In 1917, uh, Woodrow Wilson can give a speech uh, about the uh, Bill of Rights that doesn't talk about strong enforcement. Um, he says that he doesn't even refer to the Bill of Rights in any public statement over his two, two terms of office. And when he invokes a Declaration of Rights in his 1915 State of the Union address, he discusses Virginia's Declaration of Rights. And, and yet, by uh, 1941, bless you, in the time of the uh, World War II, the Hitlerian menace and the knowledge of the reality of the Gestapo and the concentration camps has fundamentally changed the way President Roosevelt is going to talk about the Bill of Rights. So tell us about the transition between Wilson and Roosevelt and how that changes the national culture. Right. So, I mean, one point to take up in, in the book is that when Woodrow Wilson brings us into World War I and gives a speech, you know, about how we're going to, you know, fight the war to end all wars and make the world safe for democracy, he never talks about the Bill of Rights or he never really talks about rights. At all. The only rights he talks about are the rights of self determination or the rights of nations uh, that are being abused by Imperial Germany. Um, so that's a big shift that occurs from then to 1941, when, as I mentioned earlier, Roosevelt says that basically our reason for fighting Hitler is to save the Bill of Rights. Right? So that reflects a broader change in the culture that occurred between World War I and World War II. Now, some of this was a direct result of. President Roosevelt's use of the Bill of Rights to defend the New Deal and explain sort of the rationales of various policies that his administration put forward. Um, FDR talked about the Bill of Rights more than all of the previous presidents combined. 
And he did so, though, largely to defend the New Deal. Sometimes it was in the context of saying, you have to support the New Deal, otherwise the Bill of Rights will be destroyed here by some sort of domestic demagogue. Sometimes he would say that, in effect, the New Deal, the expansion of government under the New Deal didn't threaten liberty because, go and read the Bill of Rights, he said in one of his radio speeches, uh, and you'll see that it's unaffected, right? Which is a way of saying the Bill of Rights is really all that matters when you think about freedom, which of course is not the view that everybody held then or holds now. Uh, but it was an effective way of trying to argue that what he was doing was constitutionally appropriate. And that raised the status of the Bill of Rights in the eyes of many people. And it's also uh, fair to say that the major constitutional changes that occurred in the 1930s because of the New Deal left a kind of vacuum that the Bill of Rights was sort of well suited to fill as a kind of new rallying point or unifying kind of theme for people of different political persuasions. And so all of that kind of culminated on Bill of Rights Day 1941, the first Bill of Rights Day. Roosevelt proposes a second Bill of Rights. And he talks not about negative liberties uh, against the state, but positive liberties uh, that can be uh, raised uh, as claims for benefits, including the right to fair housing, to a decent education, to health care, and so forth. Tell us about Roosevelt's conception. Uh, was it protection against ma majorities or protection against minorities? And how did it relate to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt championed, adopted around the same time? Right. So uh, as we get towards the end of the war, Roosevelt gives a State of the Union proposing a second Bill of Rights, basically saying that the first Bill of Rights while important, was too limited in its understanding of freedom because it only involved restrictions on the state. And that he, and, and Roosevelt liked to make the argument that necessitous men are not free men, meaning, you know, that the stuff of which dictatorships are made are poor people, hungry people, that sort of thing. And so his proposal to sort of defeat the sort of uh, possibility of fascism coming after the war at home was this second Bill of Rights that consisted of a variety of entitlements, universal health care, education, right to a job, and so on. Um, now, what's interesting about this, so there's a couple things that are interesting. One is that by saying that we needed a second Bill of Rights, he was sort of implicitly saying that the first Bill of Rights could not be changed, right? That is, that's the Bill of Rights always and forever, and so in order to have something else, we've got to call it the second Bill of Rights, rather than just saying, let's, have a, let's just rethink what the Bill of Rights is. Um, the second thing to point out is that you know, Roosevelt's conception of the second Bill of Rights was very much in keeping with the way he used the first Bill of Rights throughout most of his presidency, which was as a way of promoting government. Now, that's contrary to the way we usually think about the Bill of Rights. We think of it as being about limiting government. Um, but Roosevelt saw it as a way of legitimating government action. And thus, his list in the Second Bill of Rights was all about things that the government was going to give you or do for you, right? Um, and that understanding kind of didn't really, I mean, has survived in bits and pieces, but as a, as a sort of you know, unified idea really kind of died with him. Um, and uh, the only really part where, place where we see it was the GI Bill of Rights, which is the only legislation that actually came out of the second Bill of Rights and, of course, also had the Bill of Rights sort of attached to it, which did talk about all of these economic benefits that the state gave to returning veterans. It's so striking that you note that President George H.W. Bush on the uh, 100th anniversary, uh, the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights refers to it as a charter of negative liberties, unlike Roosevelt, who saw it as a charter of positive liberties. And one of the big uh, institutions that affected that change, you say, was the Supreme Court. And in particular, the Supreme Court's decision to strike down mandatory flag salutes in the Barnett case. Having previously upheld them just a few years earlier in the Gobitis case, the court, in one of the most inspiring First Amendment opinions of the 20th century, written by Justice Robert Jackson, says, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it's that no official, high or petty, shall prescribe what shall be orthodox in matters of conscience. Tell us about 
that case about the particular role of the flag salute, which involved an upstretched hand and why that became to be anathema and unacceptable in the age of the Hitlerian menace and why Barnett transformed our conception of the Bill of Rights. Right. So basically, until 1940, the Supreme Court hardly ever mentioned the Bill of Rights in the way that we understand it. Starting in 1940, they started talking about it a lot. And that's continued to the present day. Now, Gobitis was the first case in which the Bill of Rights was referred to frequently. And that was a case in which the court upheld mandatory flag salutes in public schools. A couple of years later, they reversed that position in another opinion that talked a lot about the Bill of Rights, but of course in a, in a somewhat different way. And you know, what's kind of critical is that in these years, the Bill of Rights then becomes a sort of touchstone for the exercise of judicial review and really a way of legitimizing judicial review. Because you know, the court had a problem, which was after the New Deal, where there was considerable controversy about how the court had used its power to strike down laws as unconstitutional, they needed a new way of explaining or sort of justifying their reasons for doing this. And the Bill of Rights provided a solution, right? Well. We're, we're not just striking down things that we think are wrong. We're striking down things that violate the Bill of Rights. So just as in the past it was, well, we need an exception for states' rights in the Bill of Rights, and that's where it's to be found. Here it was, hey, here's the reason for judicial review, the Bill of Rights. And the Barnett case is sort of a leading example of this and also supplies, I think, sort of the, the definition of how we think about the Bill of Rights now, which is that it is, in fact, about limiting government and preventing um, sort of the abuse of minorities, right? Which is dovetails with the fact that this was a definition that proved very useful for us in fighting the Cold War. And uh, I don't know if I will, maybe we'll talk about that in, in a moment, but the, you know, uh, the thought that the Bill of Rights was important in distinguishing us from the Soviets Right, was a point that President Truman would make again and again using kind of the language uh, and rationales that the Supreme Court had built up in some of these cases in the 1940s, especially on the point of religion, right? You know, we protect religion in our Bill of Rights and communism is an atheistic system which does not. So, um, so the court's role was, was critical, but they were doing it partly to enhance their own authority by justifying judicial review but just doing it in a more focused way by looking to the Bill of Rights. And, and these really critical cases came down between about 1940 and 1950. You mentioned the Cold War and President Truman. You quote him in a speech to the Federal Bar Association in 1950. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you how we're not going to fight communism. We're not going to transform our FBI into a Gestapo secret police. That's what some people would like us to do. We're going to keep the Bill of Rights on the books. And that wasn't just the Democrats. The 56 Republican platform, supported by Eisenhower, said, we hold the Bill of Rights as a sacred foundation of personal liberty. It is so striking because, as you say, before the 50s, the Republican and Democratic platforms in 1912 or 1908, for example, talked about the Constitution as the center of their vision of liberty, but it shifted by the 50s and 60s to the Bill of Rights. Tell us more about the interplay between the Supreme Court decisions and the political party's invocations of the Bill of Rights during this period. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, of course, Roosevelt and Truman being Democrats, you know, no constitutional principle really becomes one until it is bipartisan, right? Because otherwise it's just a political football. So the fact that uh, Republican presidents, you know, Eisenhower being the first one, sort of embraced the Bill of Rights in the, in the same way that Roosevelt and Truman did was really the sort of telling moment where this really became kind of a national, uh, a, a symbol of national unity. Um, and it, it's also a fact that the Bill of Rights, you know, because it c encompasses a, a broad range of topics, right, is able to provide either party, you know, there's something in it for everybody, right, basically. There's whatever disagreements you may have politically, it's just a matter of emphasis as to whether you're more keen on the Second Amendment or you're more keen on the First Amendment or you're more keen on the Fourth Amendment, right, or whichever amendment is your favorite. Uh, and so that, that was something that people found useful in sort of making 
political argument. It's also worth pointing out that it, it also related to the civil rights struggle that began in the 1950s where the argument was that the Bill of Rights was not being applied to all Americans, right? And certainly that was a position that people in both parties, you know, adhered to in, you know, the different, uh, different places and a different, to different extents. But that sort of served as a way of trying to explain to people why, you know, we needed civil rights legislation or action on civil rights. Wonderful. We have a whole bunch of great questions from the audience, and let's jump right into this. Um, this is just a superbly wonky and relevant uh, question. It says, when you look at the Constitution Center's interactive Constitution website, as you must, ladies and gentlemen, and download the app, uh, and when you research the Second Amendment, the eastern states did not reference militia, only the southern states. Was George Mason, a slave owner, responsible for using this language? This is such great close reading, ladies and gentlemen, because if you go to the interactive Constitution, <laughs> as I just happen to have here on my iPhone, you'll find, when you click on the Second Amendment, the two states, as the questioner says, Vermont and Pennsylvania, said the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves or for purposes of killing game, clearly referring to it as an individual right. By contrast, the other 11 states talk about the right of state militias not to be replaced by a federal standing army. So the brilliantly close reading questioner asks, was this a function of the slave owning states like Mason being less concerned about individual rights, perhaps because they didn't want to recognize the clash between the Bill of Rights and slavery? Right, so I think the short answer is I don't know. Uh, now the, the, uh, the longer answer would be that you know, in looking at the history of the Bill of Rights, one of the things that's kind of striking is that you don't see anybody talking about the Second Amendment except when they make a list of the entire set of the first eight or the first ten amendments and are just listing all of them uh, until President Bush 41 gave his speech on the bicentennial of the Bill of Rights in 1991. He's the first person, not just, not just president, but really significant person, to talk about the Second Amendment in the context of the Bill of Rights, meaning that here's why the Second Amendment is an important aspect of the Bill of Rights. Now, that's just interesting to me because, you know, the Second Amendment has taken on such great importance for, for, for uh, constitutional law and culture now. It's just, you know, not something that you see up until recent decades. Now, of course, there are different possible explanations for that. One could be that because everybody agreed that it was important, nobody thought it was necessary to talk about it. Or you could just say people didn't think it was all that important or didn't think about it all that much as compared to other provisions in the first set of amendments until more, more recent times. But, but no, I, I, I have to plead ignorance on the, on the specific question about you know, why the word militia was in there and what Mason's role might have been in that. We can go back to the interactive constitution, study the text, and uh, make up your own mind. But it's a wonderful question. And it just shows how relevant it is to compare the text of the Revolutionary Era constitutions with Madison's final draft. Uh, here's a great question that you address in the book as well. Is there a benefit in the present to consider the Declaration of Independence our Bill of Rights? Well, yes, in the sense that it explicitly talks about equality, right, in a way that the Bill of Rights does not. Um, that is the provision, you know, the most important provision of the Constitution that talks about equality is in the 14th Amendment, which at best is only sort of indirectly part of the Bill of Rights because it's been applied by the Supreme Court to actions of the federal government through the Fifth Amendment. Um, the reason that people referred to the Declaration of Independence as the Bill of Rights back then was really twofold. One, it looked more like the state bills of rights with all the grand language, right? So that was one thought. Um, a second thought was that abolitionists or people who were trying to fight for civil rights had to use it because it was the only thing that they could point to that explicitly talked about equality. Right? So they wanted to elevate its status by talking about it as a Bill of Rights. Now, um, is there value in, in including it? Yes, in the sense that, first of all, we all know it's very important. So, you know, why shouldn't it be included? There's one way to put it. But the other would be that it does work an explicit reference to equality into the Bill of Rights in a way that, you know, you always see that side of our uh, sort of founding ideals coming through 
other important text. You know, the Gettysburg Address, right, focuses on the Declaration, not on the Bill of Rights or the original Constitution. So there's this sort of uh, counter narrative or story about equality that's coming from these other sources. Now, why not consider the Gettysburg Address part of the Bill of Rights? Or why not consider other things part of the Bill of Rights? Why just the first 10 amendments? That's the one question that I sort of pose at the end of the book. And that relates to the final question, which is a perfect uh, opportunity for some closing thoughts. You mentioned that uh, there was disagreement throughout history about whether the first eight amendments or the first 10 amendments should be considered the Bill of Rights. Why was that? And is the Bill of Rights fixed? Uh, are they limited to the first 10 amendments? And could we imagine in the future a different set of amendments or provisions being considered part of the Bill of Rights? Well, we can choose to call the, the Bill of Rights whatever we want. You know? It's not in the Constitution that the first 10 amendments are the Bill of Rights. Uh, and doesn't require a constitutional amendment to just say that the Bill of Rights is something different. Now, whether that's a good idea or not is something that we could discuss, but it's a, not a question that anybody really asks. So that's why I wanted to ask it, sort of at the end of the book. Now, uh, as for the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, well look, some people don't like the Tenth Amendment if they're not keen on states' rights. And have in, over time, there have been people who have tried to insist that the first eight amendments are the Bill of Rights, in part to sort of downplay the tenth. Right? There are some people who don't like unwritten rights, and to the extent that they think the Ninth Amendment gives a constitutional authority to the idea of unwritten constitutional rights, they want to downplay that. So they read that out of the uh, of the Bill of Rights. Uh, so, again, there's a reason for defining the Bill of Rights as, as we do. So, you know, you, by choosing to pick the first eight or the first ten or something else, you know, you're making a statement about what's important to you or what's unimportant. And, you know, there are different approaches to what you think might be worthy of inclusion. So that's something that I think we all should give more thought to. Jared Makayoka, in this book, The Heart of the Constitution, you have increased awareness and understanding of the Bill of Rights among the American people. Please join me in thanking Gerard Makayoka. Thank you.